anxious feelings, anxious thoughts, feelings of excitement, thoughts of excitement, feeling depressed, thoughts of depression, feelings of grief, thoughts of grief, feelings of love, thoughts of love. You get the point. But why am I saying this though? What I'm implying is that the mind and body are extremely intertwined. What if you could use your body to experience better, higher order thoughts? In this video, we'll explore the mind and body connection and a technique to reduce anxiety, fear, and feelings of depression. The best part, it's easier than you think. The level of detail in this video is going to be immense and I'm excited for this topic because fear, anxiety, and depression is a common phenomenon that uh, a lot of people experience. And I always found it to be useful to have very practical approaches to dealing with things, whether it relates to being more present in life. And I talk about focusing on the five senses and whether it's this related to how we approach the mind and body in relation to helping us overcome chronic anxiety, uh, chronic feelings of fear and depression. First, let's kind of talk about how we are in relation to these different terms. Well, with depression, it deals with you having negative feelings about the past, some sort of sorrow, maybe some sort of trauma in relation to it, maybe some sort of negative experience of the past. Anxiety deals with anticipating negative stimulus to occur uh, in the future, and you are kind of living in that future right now, and you're maybe overthinking, and thus sensations of anxiety and anxiousness comes about. And then there's fear, which is actually a, a pretty useful emotion reserved for fight or flight situations, also freeze situations, right? Fight, flight, and freeze. Pretty useful for those situations in order to ensure that you stay alive. If you're gonna chase by a bear, in the wilderness, adrenaline kicks in, cortisol kicks in to help you run fast away from the bear or to fight it. Your physiology focuses on organs that help you survive rather than uh, secondary organs like your digestive system, etc., etc. But the issue is many people live in the state of fear like as their baseline. So they're constantly in that fight or flight mode. And you can only imagine what that does to our nervous system. And I'll talk more about that later in this video. Quote, our minds tend to be very active, often thinking about the past and worrying about the future instead of residing in the present moment. This can lead to the activation of stress hormones for extended periods of time, which can have adverse effects on the body. Chronic stress increases the risk of a number of diseases and disease processes in the body. Also from a metaphysical standpoint, being very stressful constantly puts you in a situation where you actually tune into and tend to attract more stressful situations. Your level of focus on stressful instances becomes your baseline, thus reality reflects that. You have thoughts of survival essentially, and thus you have emotions based around survival, more lower vibration emotions, more anxiety, more fear, etc., etc. And if this perpetuates through time, it becomes a downward spiral. It becomes easier to practice these emotions. It becomes your baseline and, you know, you go down, 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 down. So that's why it's very important to really nip, nip these in the bud before they, they really spiral out of control. Throughout everything I just said, notice a common theme here. Notice how intertwined the mind and body are. Notice how close the connection is. Notice how they correspond to one another. Quote, it's no secret that the mental and emotional stress can manifest in physical ways, playing a role in issues like aches and pains, digestive problems, headaches, high blood pressure, insomnia, muscle tension, sexual dysfunction. Now, our brain is a really powerful organ, and it's not just like this purely cognitive machine. When you experience certain events, you'll have chemicals that correspond to those events. So if it's a negative event, obviously cortisol gets released, right? The stress hormone. And if it's a positive event, like let's say it's a romantic relationship of some kind or you're dating somebody um, and you're feeling close to them, you'll release oxytocin, right? It's a more pleasurable experience. When the brain outlines that something is going on, it has a certain response to it. And then that response gets communicated with to the body. So cortisol causes you to potentially sweat, you know, potentially have a bad feeling in your gut right? Oxytocin, you may feel really warm inside and really great. These chemicals don't just affect our brain, they flow throughout our body, influencing various physiological functions. High cortisol levels affects the prefrontal cortex, suppresses the digestive system, 
and the reproductive system. That makes sense because if you think about it, if you're in a high cortisol situation, these systems in that given situation are extremely secondary. They're not, they're not that important in relation to survival. The problem though is in our modern times, what it means to survive, it means to work, it means to earn a living, it means to have a roof over your head. These types of needs, if you're constantly stressed because of these needs, you are in fight or flight, you are in survival mode. Thus, you may experience these secondary systems start to shut down or not work as properly as they should. So the mind signals the body to prepare for some sort of danger. And when we say chronic, that means it's consistent. It's like back to back to back to back. Each day you think you're in danger, right? This can also contribute to dips in serotonin, which is like this long-term feel-good chemical. If you're constantly in stress, you, you don't, you're not experiencing that much serotonin, especially people that are, people that are depressed. A lot of times they have very low serotonin levels because of the low state that they're in. So with this mind and body connection, we know that we can influence our body with our mind and we can influence our mind with our body. The mind body connection is a two way relationship where the mind influences the body and the body influences the mind. Positive thoughts may lead to a release of feel good neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, while physical sensations, positive or negative, might influence our mental state. So if we know that the mind and body are directly linked, we can utilize either of them to positively affect the other. So it's not like I just need to think great thoughts and then I'll feel better. That's a great approach, right? That works. <laughs> I do that, but it's also the other way where, hey, if I can't seem to think really positive thoughts in this moment, what can I do with my body to contribute to, to be in a higher state that attracts more positive thoughts? Maybe I go work out and my workout releases endorphins and I feel good. My physiology feels good. And then I start thinking of all the positive things in my life because of that. That's like a form of sublimation, which is an ego defense mechanism of, hey, I've received a negative stimulus or perceived negative stimulus. And now I'm going to transfer that energy into something positive by like going to the gym or doing a hobby of mine or talking to a friend. When you're immersed in positive thoughts, your physiology feels great, expansive and positive. When your nervous system is at peace, then you think more positively, at least you think more neutrally rather than more so on the negative side. That leads me to breath work, which is one of the best ways to drastically reduce anxiety, fear, and feelings of depression. Breathing is something we all do. Obviously, you wouldn't be watching this video if you weren't breathing <laughs> at least a little bit. Um, or if you can't breathe by yourself, you don't have some sort of thing that's helping you to breathe, to take in air and then to release it. The problem though is breathing isn't just this like one dimensional thing. It's a spectrum. It's about how deeply are you breathing? How well are you breathing? It's so subconscious that a lot of people miss just the power of breathing because we don't have to think about it. We just do it, right? It's very it, like we, we, we can think about it. We can make it conscious, but with all the conscious stuff we're worried about day to day, it's not, it's not an important thing to, con to consciously always think about on the surface. If, Breathing has such an effect on our physiology and our mind, we should make it very conscious each and every single day. In times of stress, our breath automatically responds by shortening and speeding up. It can become very shallow. It can be fast or short and not deep at all. This is a problem because the amount of energy you get from breathing deeply is immense and it could help with you feeling more energized, more positive. I'll talk more about that very soon. That's why you hear that adage, take a deep breath. <laughs> with practice, breath can be controlled, allowing us to utilize it as a calming mechanism during stressful times. Quote, breath work refers to breathing techniques that intentionally channel and focus on the breath. For thousands of years, Eastern medicine practices, including Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, have employed breathing techniques to calm the body and the mind. So what is breath work? There's different types of breath work out there, but to sum it all up, you're breathing deeply through your nose. You're using your diaphragm muscles to take in the air. So you're basically breathing through your diaphragm. Obviously the air is coming through your nose, but you're breathing using your diaphragm and expanding it out. And that allows you to intake more air and more oxygen. And this oxygen is great for your cells, it's great for your lungs, of course, and so many parts of your body. So you're getting air into the deepest part of your lungs. And the beauty of this is when you breathe really deeply, you can practice it both in terms of 
really in depth, like really deep breathing, but also you can practice normal breathing with your diaphragm more and it allows you to take in more air. And what you'll notice is you'll notice more feelings of relaxation, being more alert and being more alive, being more comfortable as well. It's because you're using your physiology to change your mental state. You may have a lot of negative thoughts and a lot of things going up here, but from a calm nervous system standpoint, the thoughts will correspond to that. It's so important to not let anxiety and depression and fear to be such a chronic thing in your life because you're missing so much of life by allowing it to do so. I mean, sure, you're like you're probably taking measures to work on it, but your measures can't be like here and there. They have to almost be a really solid part of your life, like a lifestyle approach to this. And this can be a breath work can be a powerful tool you use in your repertoire to, to help you with um, dealing with these, these feelings, right? Along with other things like journaling, shadow work, meditation, yoga, you know, visualization. If you pair a lot of these together consistently, you're going to see big changes in how you come about. But some people may require a lot of approaches. Others may not require that many approaches. There's others. It's just meditation that has helped them with overcoming anxiety. Other people, it's really just breath work. Other people, it's journaling. Other people, it's like self-inquiry. So it depends on the person, but it doesn't hurt to know all these methods. Now, let's talk about the nervous system and how it relates to breath work. And I'm going to tie all of this together and we'll talk about solutions really soon. Quote, when we are under stress, whether running from a predator or dealing with a particular frustrating email, the brain turns on the sympathetic nervous system, which governs the fight or flight or freeze response. You'll notice the activation of your sympathetic nervous system if you have shallow breathing, tense shoulders, increased blood pressure, or an upset stomach. So breath work helps you calm down and move your body out of the fight or flight. And you have to understand that the sympathetic nervous system is part of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is divided into two parts. The sympathetic nervous system, which I just, just talked about, and the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest part of your nervous system. So it's kind of like the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system where it's activated when you're in a very calm state, when you're eating, um, digesting food, etc., etc. You can imagine that if you're in a fight or flight scenario, digesting food becomes secondary. Why? Because it's a secondary function in relation to survival. Quote, we need our sympathetic nervous system to be aware of danger in our environment, but in today's society, we're too often in fight or flight mode when we're not actually in danger, just like I mentioned. We need to be able to tap into our parasympathetic nervous system to be able to calm sensations of stress. And that's where breathwork comes in. It helps activate that parasympathetic nervous system, right? So we're, we're activating that to de-escalate all the stress. Deep breathing may act as a manual switch to move our system from the SNS into the PNS. In other words, from a state of stress to a state of calm. Good stuff. Now let's get into solutions. How do we approach this? How do we apply breath work? I'm going to talk about two breath work techniques that I've utilized and I really like them. Um, I'll get into detail on how to, how to utilize them. First, there's diaphragmatic breathing. I love this thing. Instead of using your chest, you're using your diaphragm to de breathe deeply. So you're essentially using your diaphragm muscles to expand your rib cage and then releasing. Expand your rib cage and then releasing. Also remember that you can do it two ways where you're doing the deep breaths and then you're also doing the conscious regular breaths with your diaphragm. So that way you're kind of training your body to breathe through your diaphragm more in everyday circumstances. That way you're breathing deeply more. And we know that the breath does a lot for helping us calm down in situations. If it's a constant thing going on, we're going to be more calm throughout our day on average. The Western world is funny. I'm in the Western world because... A lot of science like does these all this research and they're like, oh, breathing deeply helps. And people in India are like, we've been saying that for like eight years. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. The yogic practice of pranayama in the ancient language of Sanskrit is a technique of breathing and breath retention that is practiced to increase the vitality, longevity, and life force of the body. Pranayama practices include the observation, control, expansion, retention, and manipulation of the breath. Pranayama is a mechanism that can help increase memory, improve circulation, and promote oxygen, oxygenation of the blood. Deep breathing doesn't make your shoulders or upper chest move dramatically. 
a sign that you're engaging your diaphragm is that your lower abdomen is filling and emptying. Place a hand on your belly and practice pushing it in and out. Now, the second approach is single nostril breathing, sometimes called channel clearing breath, alternate nostril breathing, known in Sanskrit as Nadi Shodhana, has historically been said to clear energy blockages and bring about inner balance. So what you want to do is isolate each nostril and then breathe through it deeply. I, I do suggest pairing this with like the diaphragm approach. What you want to do is not necessarily alternate, but we do want to alternate, but you want to do a couple breaths with one nostril first and then do the, another breath, like the other kind of group of breaths with the other nostril. Isolate each nostril, breathing in through only one of them at a time and then exhaling through the other. It takes some practice to get it right, but once you get the hang of it, it can be a powerful relaxation tool. There's a mudra and mudras are like these, these hand signs that correlate with certain mind states and bodily responses. There's a Vish the Vishnu mudra, which looks like this. Also put a picture of it uh, right here. And mudras are such a fascinating topic. I'll talk more about them in the future videos, but I'll definitely be talking about them in my upcoming program on the subconscious and unconscious mind called the subconscious secrets. There will be a section on mudras. Here's a quote on the Vishnu mudra. Vishnu mudra is a sacred hand gesture or seal used during yoga and meditation practice as a means of channeling the flow of vital life force energy called prana. Otherwise known as the gesture of universal balance, this mudra is named in honor of Lord Vishnu of the principal deities of Hinduism. So you see, it's pretty easy while you do breath work. You just fold your index and middle finger down and you keep your ring and pinky finger up and your thumb up. Your thumb, you want to do this with your right, with your right hand. You take your thumb and you cover one nostril and then you breathe in deeply using your diaphragm. And then your other one, you switch it and you breathe deeply using your diaphragm. And the sense of just like calmness and euphoria that comes about after this is immense. I love it. <laughs> so those are two approaches you can do literally every day and it doesn't take that long. Like you can three to five minutes, like you have three to five minutes in your day. I know you do. Um, if you watched <laughs> to the end of this video, then you have more than that actually. So those are two approaches. Now, before you know, we wrap up here, I do want to talk about a couple caveats related to breath work and calming down anxiety and fear, depression, all that stuff. So here are a couple caveats. Watch out for forgetfulness. One of the biggest things I've talked about this in, in my previous videos, one of the biggest hindrances of people's self-help is just forgetting about the practices they need to do. So it's very important to keep yourself accountable some sort of way. In my Identity Resonance program, I have my clients utilize the Habit Share app where they track their habits and what they need to do each and every single day to see results with their self-improvement and the things we talk about on calls. So I highly recommend this app, not sponsored at all. I just love using it, utilizing it. I'm not affiliated with them. Second caveat, you have to want a calm state as your baseline, not as just like this good ideal, right? So people may feel a lot of anxiety and then they look at videos on self-help and all of that. And they like idolize this as like, oh, this would be a, such a nice ideal, but they don't see it as their reality, as an assumption, as an assumption, as I am this already. That's so important to have that, that you're just assuming that my baseline is a peace is, is at peace. And by assuming it, you take measures to ensure that it is, or you just subconsciously become at peace. It's not about idolizing, like being in a peaceful state. It's about assuming so. And it's also about not being addicted to all the stress responses in the body because that's emotional addiction. The body and mind get used to these stress responses and it's weird not having these stress responses all the time. Like, for example, it may feel weird to you to be very calm. Maybe people around you in your life, they may be like, what's wrong with you? You, you seem so calm. Are you, is everything okay? <laughs> like, you're, like, they're not used to it. You're not used to it. But you stick with it by doing the breathing exercises and the things I talked about in this video, it'll be a norm, right? That's something I can relate to. Like when I was first really getting into spirituality, I'd have these days of just peacefulness and just calm. And in a sense, like my brain was almost tricking me and saying, wow, this is boring, right? I need something to spike my emotions. But I realized where that was coming from. And then now calm is my baseline. 
I can still experience like spiked emotions in a positive direction, but those circumstances that used to spike my emotions in a negative direction, it just doesn't happen anymore. And I'm okay with that because I'm not addicted to that. It's been years since I kind of was. <laughs> Don't pressure yourself, right? Don't pressure yourself to be like a Zen monk right meditating in the himalayas <laughs> of, of india and being very zen like 24 7. just practice being more more at peace through breath work practice being more at ease practice calming down your physiology even if it's just for 10 minutes out of the day if you previously weren't calm at all that's progress if it's just an hour out of the day and previously you weren't calm at all throughout your entire day that's still progress you want to gain that dopamine from the small victories not just the big kind of grand victory this will keep you consistent through time and that goes for any habits really and of course you know the mind will wander always remember that thoughts will come about that's kind of natural as the more you do this the more you meditate the more you do breath work um the more you can watch it and the less often it happens but even now like i've been doing meditation for nine years my mind wanders especially in the beginning you know but then it gets to a point where I get right into a flow state. My mind definitely wanders a lot less than previously, right? Previous years, earlier years, but it still happens. Um, understand it's part of the process. The When you do it for long enough and you're patient with yourself, you're not judging yourself throughout, you'll hit an inflection point of Zen and flow state in your meditation, in your breath work. We don't have to have anxiety and fear and depression as our baseline. In fact, with breath work, peace can be our baseline. Your life is completely ran by involuntary and second nature based behaviors. These behaviors have a huge bearing on how your life turns out. But you have some effect on these behaviors since you can encode the right beliefs using your subconscious mind. The subconscious secrets is going to completely change how you approach your self improvement for the rest of your life.